Let's stand together. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 25. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Then let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. You may be seated. Perhaps you've seen that video before called The Cosmic Eye. It's dizzying and kind of overwhelming. The expanse of the universe down to the smallest quark or neutrino inside of a cell. We are picking up where we left off in our, last week in our series on the gospel in Genesis. Last week we looked at the good news of a creator. All that exists came into being by the intent and will and design of a good creator. This week we look at the good news of creation. The good news of creation. Last week we looked at Psalm 19. The heavens declare something to us about God, about his glory, his power. Creation, in other words, the Bible tells us, is speaking to us all the time. The psalmist says there's no language where their voice is not heard, meaning he's, God is always saying something to us through the created order, if we're listening. Albert Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. You have to ponder that for a minute. The thing that he's writing from a naturalist, materialist worldview. It's not a Christian, not even a theist, not even a deist. And he's saying the thing that makes the least sense about the universe is that you can understand it. Einstein's speaking this way, perhaps the brightest mind that's ever lived. That could be debated, but he's among them. Which is funny. Why do we use the word Einstein and then it calls somebody dumb? Like, nice shot, Einstein. Like we say that to people. <laughs> it's supposed to be a compliment anyway. That's not. <laughs> from this perspective, though, from the naturalist, materialist worldview, why should anything be understandable? If your brain and my brain are the product of random, unguided processes, why should you trust your brain? Why should anything make sense? John Lennox famously said, what do you do science with, to his atheist scientific d debate partner? They wouldn't say your mind. They don't believe in a consciousness or a mind. They'd say your brain. Tell me about your brain, he says. Your brain, by evolutionary theory, is the process of random, unguided, it's, it's, it's the result of random, unguided processes. And you trust it, he says. Tell me, if you knew for a fact that your computer, which you use every day to do your job, was the result of random, unguided processes, would you trust it? Even the non-scientific average person talks as if the universe has meaning, though, right? You see Facebook posts or Instagram posts. The universe is trying to tell me something. Perhaps you even type that out, right? I feel like the universe is speaking to me. Actually, the Bible says yes. He is through the created order. There's entire websites devoted to helping you discern the messages that the universe is giving you. I think you'd do better to read Genesis 1. Tells us the universe itself is created. It had a beginning. Stephen Hawking, famous atheist, a cosmologist, says for, for anything to have caused the universe, and he doesn't believe there is a first cause of, or God, it would have to be 
spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably imaginably powerful. Let me say that again. Stephen Hawking, an atheist, says, for anything to have caused the universe, it would have to be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and unimaginably powerful. What does that sound like to you? <laughs> the sheer size of the universe is difficult to comprehend. We live in a tiny subdivision of the universe called the Milky Way. I'm no astrophysicist, I'm no cosmologist, I, I don't even, I'm not, I, I, I like history, philosophy, theology, literature. I was bad in math and average in science, but I enjoy reading about it. So you see an image here of the Milky Way galaxy from Earth. That's looking at our galaxy from, not the center of it, but in our solar system. And the next image here of Milky Way from space, you saw that as we, as we zoomed out on that, on that video. The, it's so vast, the unit of measure to measure the universe and even our galaxy is what we call a light year. The light, the speed of light, how far light would travel in one year. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That means it would travel 5.88 trillion miles in one calendar year. The Milky Way galaxy is approximately 100,000 light years across. 5.88 trillion miles in a year, 100,000 of those. This is beyond comprehension, and we're just getting started. Our galaxy contains billions and billions of stars. If you were to count them all at the rate of one star per second, it would take you nearly 3,000 years, just in our galaxy. Scientists tell us that they know they are aware of hundreds of billions of galaxies in the known universe. And Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. By the breath of his mouth, all their starry host. The vastness of the universe can lead you to see your own life as insignificant, Right? You can look up at the night sky and you think about just the sheer size and magnitude and vastness of it. It can make you feel like, what, what do I, what does my life even matter? I'm just, a, I'm just a nothing speck. But Genesis 1 is telling us that we are not here in this vast universe as a product of random chance, but by the intention and the design and the will of a creator. And that is good news. So you might ask, well, why why billions and billions of stars in billions and billions of galaxies? Why so much of it? For one thing, maybe God enjoys making it. But another thing, if, if we're not talking about a universe large enough for random chance, but we're talking about a, a, a universe, the vastness of the universe is communicating something to us. Because an incomprehensibly vast universe is exactly the right size to communicate an incomprehensibly glorious God. When asked why there were so many billions of stars and solar systems and galaxies in the universe, Dr. Hugh Ross once said, in the final analysis, perhaps it is because God enjoys it and for his glory. God put his glory and goodness on display in his creation. From the largest star, the largest supernova, to the smallest part subatomic particle. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 tells us, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your good pleasure they were created, including you and including me. So we're going to look at the good news of creation. First, we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating. Creation is good. The first week of the series, Pastor John Dixon uh, talked to us about this in contrast with the ancient Near Eastern pagan mythologies of creation myths where creation itself was the result of a, a cosmic struggle between the gods that we are accidents, we are fallout or wreckage from a, a battle of the, of the deities and that nature is creation itself is not to be trusted, is uh, dangerous, unpredictable. And certainly we see some of that in, our, in the natural world today, but fundamentally Genesis 1 is telling us, despite the uncertainty and the difficulty, which we'll get to in Genesis 3, fundamentally creation is good. Over and over again we see God seeing and saying it is good. This point is emphasized over and over again in the first chapter of Genesis by the phrase, and God saw that it was good. We see it six times there, and next week, the final seventh time, God will say, see all that he's made and call it very good. Creation is good in its individual parts, 
It's good in its entirety. It's good in what it produces. It's good in how it operates. It's good in what we can understand. It's good in the, in the laws that, by which it's governed. It's good in the things that we cannot comprehend. In all of it, it's good. Hebrew word for good is the word tov. It, it means uh, pleasurable, delightful, agreeable, excellent, valuable, according to the right and good standard. Fundamentally, creation is good because it was spoken to existence by a good God. It comes from him. So what, what, why does it matter to us that creation is good? Why should you care? What difference does it make in your life? Just a couple of things here. If God calls it good, then who are you and who am I to disagree? The goodness of God in creation is one of the laws uh, and the ways in which he's given us to connect with him. How many of you have had the experience of feeling close to God in nature? Anybody? Yeah? Some of us naturally, like we want that, we long for that, and maybe the winter in Illinois makes it hard for you. Although today was nice, wasn't it, with the snow on the trees? We get little glimpses of his goodness. A second or third, we cannot claim to love a good God, a good creator, and act in a way that ignores, harms, or abuses his creation if we believe it is good. This is not a political statement about environmentalism or, or, you know, or climate change. I'm simply saying as followers of Jesus, God invented, God created, God designed, and we acknowledge that, and so we live in his good world, and we above all people should care about creation. Finally, if God created all good and infused his creation with his goodness and love, then we can be sure that he's not done with it, despite its problems, nor with us. He will one day redeem and, the Bible says, recreate all things. So this hope is connected to how and why we can pray for healing. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, when you pray for God to intervene and heal somebody of their sickness, restore their body and mind, you have to believe that nature, cre creation, is the product of a good God. And a good God made it good. And what you're, someone's experiencing in cancer or in sickness is not how God intended it. And he can, should he choose, intervene and heal it. And even if he doesn't in this moment when I want him to, he will one day restore all things. But we're jumping ahead a bit to Genesis 3. And as good as creation is, the second point is creation is not God. This might sound obvious today, and you're probably thinking, well, I'm not worshiping trees. But it's a clear emphasis of Genesis 1, and it's profoundly relevant for us today if we think about it rightly. Genesis 1 is contrasting and standing against the pagan religions of the ancient Near Eastern world where worship of the sun and of the moon and of the heavenly bodies was commonplace. We read about God calling Abraham when he was Abram out of Ur of the Chaldeans where the, the, the primary God was the moon God. Imagine Genesis 1 saying, the moon is just a lesser light. In fact, it's actually just a mirror reflecting light. And they're worshiping it. Or the Egyptians, Ra, the sun god. Genesis chapter 1, verse 16. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. By the way, I think that's funny. Billions and billions of stars and billions and billions of galaxies. Oh yeah, I made those too, God says. Like a, like a little add-on. Oh, and, and the stars. I made all those. Notice that in this passage, the sun and moon are not called by their names. In Hebrew, they're just called greater and lesser lights. And they knew names for the for sun and moon. It's as if the author is saying, it's like a polemic. He's critiquing those who worship created things. They're just lights. They come from the creator. Even, you might think, well, the moon's not a light. It's just a planet that reflects the sun's light. Even there is a theological point being made. All light in the universe is derivative light. It comes from the source. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. Before he separated the lights or named them or made them, he's the light. And similarly, you and I have no light within ourselves. We can only reflect the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the moon reflects the light of the sun, so we reflect the light of the sun. And you might be thinking, well, we don't really worship the sun or the moon today. This is not my issue. 
But in, in Romans chapter one, the apostle Paul in verse 25 says that people in his day and in our day exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they served and worshiped created things rather than the creator. For that, that's not something that just the ancients did. That's going on all around us today. And it's a bad exchange every time. You lose in the deal if you worship the creation rather than the creator. If you worship the good gifts of God rather than the good giver, God himself. Creation, in other words, is a wonderful signpost. It's made to point us to God, to tell us something about who God is and what he's like. It's a terrible God. It always leads to isolation, despair, destruction. It's meant to point us to God. What a tragedy if we worship the creation rather than the creator. Do you ever, how many of you are dog people? Any dog people in here? My, my people. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever point, at your do- like point to your dog and you're trying to point like, your dog to go, like, you point, like your treats are over there. Go in the corner. Go outside. Sit down. What, do you, what happens when you point for where your dog should go? What does your dog do? My dog doesn't go. Maybe your dog's smarter than my dog. My dog looks at my finger. Like, Dad, go right there. My dog goes, hmm. <laughs> like, like, looks at my, Does your dog do that? Like they're looking at the thing. Uh, like, no, over there, right? I have to drag my Ivy over there to her spot. She's 15 and she's like a crazy old person in the house. Anyway, I think in some ways that's like, that's like worshiping the creation. Staring at the finger, missing the point. Creation is pointing us to God. Look, look at how good he is. Look at how glorious he is. Look at how beautiful and majestic he is. And we're missing the point, many of us. So to sacrifice a relationship with God for the things he created is a terrible deal. Look at this quote here from a book called The Genesis Enigma. Do we have that? There we go, yeah. Andrew Parker, by the way, is not a Christian. He's not a believer. He was an atheist. He's become an agnostic. He's a uh, professor of uh, molecular biology at, at Oxford University. Here's what he writes in this book, The Genesis Enigma. I must admit, rather nervously, as a scientist averse to entertaining such an idea, that the evidence that the writer of the first page of the Bible was divinely inspired is very strong indeed. What a statement from an atheist agnostic. If ever there was a page of literature that would cause me to believe in God, it would be Genesis 1. He said, I'm not there yet, but I acknowledge that as a molecular biologist, what I observe in Genesis 1 is astounding. Later in that same chapter, he talks about, I can't fathom how the ancients knew this. This brings us to the, the next point, creation is blessed. Creation is blessed. The fifth day of creation, in verses 20 through 23, God begins filling his creation with life. So we've talked about this before. The first three days are the forming days of creation. God is separating things and ordering things, separating light from darkness, dry land from the sea, sky, uh, the expanse of sky, the waters above, waters below. He's separating and ordering and, and preparing, forming the earth in order to do what? To fill it with life. And that begins on day four and day five. He's filling the earth with life. And first he creates fish of the sea and birds of the air. Classic evolutionary theory tells us that the birds evolved from the land animals. Flying things came after crawling things and walking things. Genesis 1 is telling us something different. Look at verse one, chapter 1, verse 22. And God blessed them. This is interesting to me. The first audible word of blessing is spoken over not human beings, that comes later, but over fish and birds. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas. And let the birds multiply on the earth. The blessing of God involves the reproduction, new life, continued life. It is God's intent and his good purpose and blessing that life, all life, should reproduce, should fill the earth. And the same blessing will be repeated with an interesting new command in chapter 1, verse 28, which we'll get to next week. Be fruitful, multiply. It's a blessing from God. 
And then we come to verse 24 through 25 of Genesis chapter 1. This is the beginning of the sixth day. The sixth day has the creation of the animals on earth and then, of course, human beings, which we'll get to next week. And I want you to notice a phrase that gets repeated. See if you can pick it out. If you can't, you're not paying attention. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Could you pick it out, class? <laughs> Four times in two verses, and nine times in chapter one, God uses this phrase, according to their kinds. Clearly, God's trying to make a point here. And scholars debate this like crazy. Young earth creationists, theistic evolutionists, and everyone in between debate what does this mean or what doesn't it mean? We, I want to let you know that there's room for disagreement and debate, but here's the primary point all believers in God and faithful Christians should agree on. Life is not an accident. The diversity of the natural animal world is intended by the creator. He intended it. It is not at all the product of random, unguided, natural processes. God said, and it happened. For life to evolve, if you want to use that word, or be created, or grow and diversify, requires two things. Pre-existent biological matter, which God spoke into existence, and the divine creative word of God himself. Each of these things happens because God said Animal life did not evolve out of plant life. And according to Genesis 1, we did not come from one primordial cell. Now that's not to say that God could not, had he, if he chose, use the evolutionary process. Because evolution, as a word, means at least three different things. Number one, it, it means adaptation and mutation within a, a range, a species range. That's clearly evidenced in the fossil record and then observable in the natural world. Number two, it means the uh, sort of the, the origins uh, story of all life, Darwin's origin of species. And number three, it means the, the mechanisms, natural selection, survival of the fittest by which this happens. Even atheist scientists will tell you that in terms of definition one, that's, that all, everyone agrees. In definition two and three, that's very much in dispute, very much in debate. Not just between Christians and non-Christians, but in the scientific world. But in common language, we say evolution is an established fact. People say this. And they're referring to, to definition number one. Anyway, we're, we're getting off the, off the reservation a bit here. <laughs> Listen to this quote from John Lennox in his book, Seven Days That Divide the World. As far as Genesis is concerned, you do not get from the inorganic to the organic without and God said. Life did not come from non-life simply by process of development. Life required not only pre-existent matter, but also a special creative word of God. When you read through Genesis 1, it's almost as if the author, God, anticipated, foresaw the contemporary debates about the origin of life and human life. Here's the core message. Genesis chapter 1 is the exact opposite of a mindless, unguided, natural process. It's exactly the opposite, Darwinian or otherwise. The beauty and diversity of life on earth is the result of the intention of the creator. It was in his mind. I think this is why we're drawn to it. We, many minute ago I asked you if you've ever had a moment where you connected with God and nature and almost every hand went up. What is that about? How many of you honestly have ever watched Planet Earth documentaries, or the Blue Planet documentaries, or those shows that they show animal life. Anybody? Why do we love those? I love them. I like the ones where animals attack each other, but that's a different thing. <laughs> I think it's because in some way, in the natural world, our hearts are being spoken to about the goodness of the Creator. I, I thought it'd be good for us just to take a minute here while we're together and, and ponder and wonder in awe at the beauty and diversity of life on planet Earth that our Creator designed. Psychologists have done research actually on the benefits of spending time in nature, the mental health and physical benefits of spending time in nature, and more recently, the, the psychological, mental health, and physical benefits of just watching, even on a screen, nature. Why? 
I think it's because our creator is saying something to us through what he's made about his glory and his beauty. God made this world and he blessed it and he filled it. He made a world for us in which we would live and enjoy and delight in it, in it itself, though knowing it's not God. A world in which we should care for. Creation care should be critical to the life of the follower of Jesus and believer in God. And a, a world in which we not only delight in and care for, but which we know him in, most importantly. That's the blessing of God in creation. Delight in it, care for it, and know your creator in it. To know all this wonderful and awesome creator made us in and I want to just pause and go back to verses 14 through 16 of chapter 1 for a minute. Because I think uh, we can pass right over this. It, it sounds so ancient and simplistic. But God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The word signs is the Hebrew word mazaroth. It, it, it refers to constellations. The Babylonians took that and, and made what we might call the Zodiac, corrupted it into like fortune telling. But the Hebrews understood that what the Maseroth, the constellations are really telling us is about the glory of God. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. The oldest book in the Bible, by the way, in terms of when it was written, is not Genesis. Anybody know what it is? Job. The ancient book of Job, a treatise on suffering. Job is between 1200, written 1200 to 1300 BC. The Bible is not a scientific uh, textbook, but when it speaks to matters of science, it's utterly trustworthy. Let's look at Job 38, verses 31 to 32. God speaking to Job when Job was pondering the meaning of suffering. God says, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth constellations in their season? Can you guide the bear with its children? Three constellations we know about mentioned here in this text. The Pleiades, Orion, and the bear, Arcturus, in other words. Think about this for a minute. 1300 BC, this is written. Can you bind the cords of the Pleiades? You'll see an image here of the Pleiades on the screen. The Pleiades are sometimes known as the Seven Sisters, an open cluster of the, in the constellation of Taurus. It's classified as an open cluster because it's a group of hundreds of stars formed from the same cosmic cloud, made of the same, about the same uh, cosmic age and material, roughly the same chemical composition. Most importantly, these stars, hundreds of them, are bound together by mutual gravitational attraction, and they're moving through space held together in formation. Isabel Lewis of the United States Naval Observatory quotes, Astronomers have identified 250 stars as actual members of this group, all sharing in common motion and drifting through space in the same direction, much like a flock of birds flying in unison through the sky. And God says, 1300 B.C. to Job, Can you, what? Bind the Pleiades? Can you hold the Pleiades together? I can. And then he talks about Orion. Some of you might know Orion's belt, those three stars. That we, that's the only part I can ever find in the sky. I can never see Orion. I can just see the three stars together in his belt. And he says, can you loose the cords, the belt of Orion? Unlike the Pleiades, Orion's belt is not three stars. It's two stars in a, th a triple star cluster, and they're moving apart from each other. So far away, we can't tell, but I don't have time to get into it now, but I can read to you how the two stars that are the lower end of the belt are moving away from each other, and that triple star cluster is combining so that in several hundred thousand light years, there will be no belt anymore. God says to Job, 1300 BC, can you lose the belt of Orion? I am. I can. Day is a thousand years of Lord, a thousand years a day. And then last he talks about, this one blew my mind. The great bear and its cubs. Arcturus Major. Looks like a single star to us, but it's not actually. I'll read this section because it's, it's bonkers. Arcturus is one of the brightest stars in the night sky. God challenged Job to guide Arcturus with his sons. With this challenge, God appeared to be saying, Hey, Job, you think you can direct Arcturus anywhere you want? Well, I can. In 1971, astronomers discovered there were 52 additional stars connected directly with Arcturus, known as the Arcturus Stream, the Cubs. 
Charles Burkhalter of the Cabot uh, Observatory said, these stars are a law unto themselves. Arcturus is one of the greatest suns in the known universe, a runaway whose speed is 357 miles per second. Arcturus, we have every reason to believe, possesses thousands of times the mass of our sun. Our sun is traveling only 12 miles a second, but Arcturus is traveling you know, exponentially faster. It's a runaway. Co the combined attraction of all the stars in our galaxy could not stop him or even turn his path. Arcturus and his children, cubs, were on a course all their own. Only God has the power to guide them. Now, I don't think God is giving Job a lesson in astronomy, or us for that matter. What he's saying is, these things which you marvel at and cannot comprehend, I made, I guide, I hold together. And you can trust me to guide and hold together your life as well. That's the essential message of Genesis 1. You are not here by accident. You're here by the design and the intention and the will of a creator. We're going to come to that next week. All that exists in its diversity and beauty and incomprehensibility is from the mind of an intentional creator. He's holding it all together, and you can trust him. And he blessed this world in which we live with all of its problems, which mostly we create, for, to be a world in which we would delight in, marvel at, as we just did, care for, because it's good, and most of all, know him. That's the goal for this series, to know him, the gospel in Genesis. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you and we marvel at your creation. And we, like David in Psalm 8, look at the heavens and wonder, what are we that you're mindful of us? It's hard to comprehend. And if this universe and it's all of its vastness were just an accident or the product of random, unguided processes, then it would indeed be a question that we could never answer. But we know that it's not. You've told us it is not. The vastness of the universe is declaring the vastness of your glory. And we're here by your design to know you, our Lord Jesus. We thank you and pray in your name. Amen. As we say each week, if you're here this morning and need a prayer, members of our prayer team meet with the classroom. We'd love to encourage you to pray for you, to pray with you for any reason. Now, brothers and sisters, may the love of God the Father surround you, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit fill you, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be yours now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.